Numbers chapter 6. Some have referred to this particular passage as the Lord's Prayer of the Old Testament. I think that's probably a good name for it. Others have called it the priestly benediction. Others have called it the uh, benediction of Aaron, because it would be his family as the high priest, Aaron and his sons, who would deliver this particular prayer, the blessing of the high priest is what we're calling it tonight. And so this particular blessing was one that was given to the children of Israel. It was one that was administered after some of the other offerings that were uh, given. And so, uh, in fact, if you read with me and notice a couple things, it says, verse 22, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his son, saying, This is the way you shall bless the children of Israel. Say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. And so they shall put My name on the children of Israel and I will bless them. And so Moses is given this instruction from God. God uh, obviously wanting that to be that message to be delivered to Aaron and his sons as the priests, uh, as the family of the high priest. And so that would be the, the priestly benediction, if you will, given to the children of Israel. It's interesting that the Jewish Talmud, which is a compilation of Jewish laws, which would include uh, really two, is broken into two parts. You have the Mishnah, which was 613 codified laws uh, added, if you will, by the rabbis, and then the Gemara, which was basically a commentary on the rabbinical laws that were added. And so uh, that makes up the Talmud. So you have the Mishnah and the Gemara. According to the Talmud, uh, in particular the Mishnah, this blessing was read every day in the temple. So this was something that was read on a regular basis. Those verses that we just read, verse 22, or rather 24, 25, and 26 of number 6. And it's interesting because as it was being read, this was the only time uh, in the temple that they would use that name for God, Yahweh. And so uh, it became the case that uh, later down the road that others, especially when it came uh, after the carrying away to Babylon and, and so forth, when synagogue worship uh, became a thing, uh, in the synagogues they would... Uh, not use the word Yahweh, they would use the word Adonai. And so, as well in other parts of worship, uh, even uh, early on, uh, when using the word Yahweh in this particular passage, uh, in other blessings and other readings, they would not use the word Yahweh. They would use the word Adonai, which meant master. And they did this out of respect uh, is the best is what I can determine from from reading different things. They did this out of respect for fear, really, that they might say that name wrong, that they might uh, accent it uh, in a wrong way, that they may say something just uh, not right. And so, uh, out of respect for God, they would use the word Adonai instead of Yahweh. Uh, and and there again, it shows to me a great respect uh, for God. Uh, but there's also probably uh, a consequence of doing that through the years. Because then it not only became, well, okay, well, we fear, we don't want to say God's name wrong, but it might have turned into something else where when God's name, that word Yahweh, uh, was being invoked, and verse 27 gives the idea that that's the name that was to be invoked and, ble and, and if you will, put out there upon the people was Yahweh's name. That's what he wanted. It, essentially, if they get to the point that somewhere down the road they're not using that, it may lose a little bit of its emphasis in some way. Uh, at least that's one argument. And so it began out of reverence, uh, maybe, but uh, certainly there's some consequences that, that came through the years, maybe because of that. But let's just break down these three verses and look at the priestly benediction. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. Here is a general blessing, if you will, 
Uh, the word blessed is simply the idea of prosperity, uh, well-being, and, and that's obviously what uh, the, the priests were uh, proclaiming upon the children of Israel, this blessing that they were uh, speaking unto uh, the children of Israel. I want you to notice with me Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy 28, beginning in verse 2. Deuteronomy 28, verse 2. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body, the produce uh, of your ground, and the increase of your herds, the increase of your cattle, the offspring of your flocks. Blessed, be, uh, blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before your face. They shall overcome, or they shall rather come out against you, one way and flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing on you in your storehouses and, and in all to which you set your hand, and He will bless you in the land which uh, the Lord your God is giving you. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to Himself, just as He has sworn to you. If you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in His ways, then all, all peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord. There again is the word Jehovah. The word Yahweh is being invoked here. And they shall be afraid of you. And the Lord will grant you plenty of goods, the fruit of your body, the increase of your livestock, the produce of your ground, the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. The Lord will open to you His good treasure, the heavens, to give rain to your land in its season, to bless the, all the work of your hand, <clears throat> You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. And the Lord will make, make you the head and not the tail. And you shall, be above, you shall be above only and not be beneath. If you heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, and are careful to observe them, he says, so you shall not turn aside from any of these words which I command you this day to the right or to the left to go after other gods to serve them. And so this blessing we, we see really being presented in a couple of places, not just then on that occasion where they would, the children of Israel would come to the priests bringing their offerings and their sacrifices or going by daily unto the temple and hearing that priestly benediction read before the people. That blessing was seen in numerous ways. But obviously it had to do with their increase, their plenteous harvest time, their success in all their undertakings as a nation, as they're going into this land, they would be blessed beyond what anybody could have possibly imagined. They were going into the land that flowed with milk and honey, and they were going to be provided all of these things. Yes, the Lord would bless them, but also this idea of bless and keep you. Keep brings about the idea of guarding, guardianship, a guarding, a protecting. And, and this really is the, the reverse of that blessing in, in this way, that God should guard against such things that would take away that possible blessing. And so the Lord bless you and the Lord guard against those who might take away that blessing from you or those things that might come up, a drought, hostile invasions, whatever the case may be. And certainly they would encounter numerous of those things throughout their history. And so this was the idea. Psalm 121, verse 7 and 8. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life, the psalmist wrote. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth forevermore. <clears throat> so the psalmist then repeating what Moses has also then written in Deuteronomy. This idea of the Lord will keep your, your going and your coming. When you're going out, especially to harvest, and when you're coming back in, 
He would be protecting them, not just providing a wonderful success in their harvest, not just providing all the rain and the sun that they would need to to be able to to take care for those crops to to do what they're supposed to do and bring forth that plenteous harvest, but but also in their going out to harvest and their coming back from harvest. They would be cared for. They would be, be blessed. They would be protected in those ways. And so this blessing, again, has far-reaching ideas, certainly with it. Well, today the Lord blesses us as well. And these blessings come in Christ as we studied this morning, Ephesians 1 and verse 3. They are available, especially then, uh, to those uh, type of character, characteristics that we read in the Beatitudes. Notice with me in Matthew chapter 5, beginning the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, beginning of verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness' sake, for they shall be filled. Blessed are those, or blessed are rather the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you, he says, when they shall revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. He says, great is your reward in heaven. And so persecuted they the prophets who were before you. And then that reminder that you're, you're the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world. And so he's building upon a certain type of character, certainly the one who would be blessed in following the Lord. And so certainly today the Lord blesses, and today the Lord is our keeper as well. Again, the psalmist wrote, Psalm 121 and verse 5, The Lord is your keeper, the Lord is your shade on your right hand. Get the idea then, this idea of, of, of battle, or this idea in, in the power, the authority, and making decisions, this idea that is uh, brought forth from this, that in all these things, the Lord is the one who is guarding, the one who is protecting, the one who is keeping. And so the Lord bless you and keep you. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Philippi that the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Philippians 4 and verse 7. The second part of this from verse 25, the Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. This indicates then God's favor toward His children, His, His grace upon them. And we often will identify that, that grace and we talk about that unmerited favor. But it is about that favor, God's favor, His grace toward His people. And you have this idea then, especially those who may not necessarily even be deserving of such. And yet, because He is our Father, He wants to give that to us. He wants to bestow that upon us. And you've likely heard... Uh, this phrase before, a smile is catching. What do we mean when we say that? A smile is catching. It's, if, if I'm smiling at, at someone, then typically you get a smile back, right? And when somebody's not smiling at you, something's off, right? You know that something is not quite right. Um, that frown or that scowl uh, that maybe you're giving me even right now. I'm not sure if that's the case, but you could be giving me right now. Uh, that's not needed. I don't need that. I'd rather have that smile, that smiling face. Why? Because it shows a little bit of approval at the very least. That's the least that it does. It, it gives, it, it, it opens the door, but it also then puts us at ease because there's a sense of approval in that smile. And this is, this is the idea. The Lord makes His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. His face shining may also uh, indicate then that He is approving of our 
actions as we serve Him, as we follow Him. And you notice from Deuteronomy uh, chapter 28 where we read a moment ago, there was a condition that was involved in all of that blessing. And that, that was that they shouldn't go to the right or to the left, but continue to follow the commandments of the Lord. This also may have reference to a passage uh, where we see the, the radiant glory of God uh, as it's expressed in even the, uh, the very face of Moses as he comes down from the mountain. So Exodus, read with me, Exodus 34. We won't read all of this. Exodus 34, <clears throat> beginning of verse 29. Now it was so when... Moses came down from Mount Sinai, and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand. When he came down from the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. So when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, they were afraid to come near him. Then Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the children of Israel came near, <clears throat> and he gave to them the commandments as the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. So, in Moses, with his time that he was on Mount Sinai there, speaking with God, receiving the tablets of stone, and in so doing, the Ten Commandments, and in so doing, the very divine presence of God was so bright that Moses' face was lit up, literally, so much so that it, it scared the people. It scared Aaron and, and, and the Israelites. And so it bothered them. And so this also then may have reference to that radiant glory of the divine presence of God. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The psalmist pled for God's favorable disposition toward them. We see it in numerous passages, Psalm 31, verse 16. Make your face shine on your servant. Save me with your steadfast love. Psalm 67, verse 1. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make His face to shine upon us. Psalm 80, we find it three times. This phrase is used over and over. Restore us, O God, let your face shine that we may be saved. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine, that we may be saved. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Let your face shine, that we may be saved. Psalm 80, verse 3, verse 7, and verse 19. Today, God's grace is certainly upon all of mankind. We understand that in, in, in a generic sense where uh, he makes the, the rain and the sun to shine upon uh, all, all of humanity, whether they're evil or whether they're good. But also, more specifically, His grace is upon all mankind because we see that in the gospel. The Apostle Paul wrote to Titus, Titus 2, beginning in verse 11, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, he says, waiting for that blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all, uh, all lawlessness, to purify for himself a people for his own possession, who are zealous <coughs> excuse me, for good works. Titus 2, verses 11 through 14. This grace came about through Christ, by Christ. According to John chapter 1 and verse 17, and His grace is offered to the whole of mankind. And yet what we see is probably uh, one of the saddest passages, the reminder that only a few will find it. Matthew chapter 7, 13 through 14. But ultimately, as we go back to Numbers chapter 6, what do we see? Not only this in verse 25... The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. But what is the source of this grace? Who is the source of this grace? That answer is found in verse 27. So they shall put my name 
on the children of Israel and I will bless them. You see, the source of these blessings is God Himself. Not man, not some preacher, not any preacher. Not even the, the, the priests who were giving this benediction, this blessing unto the people. But rather, it was by the Lord. And that's what we have to remember as well. <clears throat> the Lord lift up His countenance upon thee and give thee peace. This word peace is a word that you've probably heard before. Shalom. Offered to those upon which whom, or rather, whom the Lord Himself has, shine, has shown His face, the one who has received His grace, those individuals, they have peace. That's not peace that the world uh, could offer. That's not peace that, that, that the world could, could provide that would give us a, a, a real idea of peace. You know, when we think of peace in the world, we think of the idea of, uh, of the absence of negativity, the absence of war, the absence of some kind of hostility. That's not real peace. You see, real peace comes from God. And it is this idea from the word shalom. It is this idea that this is the one who has peace from God because God has made His face to shine upon Him. This is about the inner man. And while all those things may be going on around us that might try to strip us of that peace, that might try to take that peace from us, this true peace indicates a state of righteousness, a state of well-being, and the assurance of those things that cannot be taken from us. And again, this peace is that which only God can provide for mankind. It is stability. It is calmness. Utter tranquility, some will say. Captured in, even in the words of Isaiah. Isaiah 26 and verse 3. Isaiah says, You keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. That word keep again is that idea, that guardianship. And the prophet is calling upon God, keep him in perfect peace. The one whose mind is focused is stayed on you. Because he trusts. He trusts in you. And for us today, we have our peace in Christ. Romans 5 and verse 1, Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The faithful child of God has made available to Him a peace that passes all understanding. Again, Philippians 4 and verse 7. But this is again followed up with verse 27, that command to the priest, so they shall put my name upon the people of Israel and I will bless them. That name again in its original form, the name of God, the name of Jehovah, pointed to that timeless, eternal nature of God without beginning and without an end, existing at all times and at any time, before time was ordained by man and long after time shall end. That's what that word seems to indicate, that word Yahweh. And when that word is invoked in this blessing, it was that eternal promise that God was truly their God. And they were truly His children, His people. God has promised great and precious promises, according to 2 Peter 1 and verse 4. And the psalmist again says, Make thy face to shine upon your servant. Save me for mercy's sake. Today our high priest is seen in Christ. Look with me in Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. <clears throat> In Hebrews 4, beginning of verse 14, <clears throat> seeing then that we have a great high priest 
who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have an high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted like we are, and yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. When I read the priestly benediction, when I read number six, I'm reminded of the eternal God who told His people, I will bless you. I will keep you. I will shine my face upon you. My divine presence, in other words, will be with you. And I'll be gracious unto you, providing mercy, and I'll lift up my countenance upon you, and you'll have peace. And an all-powerful, all-knowing, eternal God who loves His children that much, who chose us to be saved. He chose the gospel by sending it, His only begotten Son, by sending that message of that good news to mankind so that we can respond properly. But in that, what do we have? Peter says, great and precious promises. Isn't that wonderful? What a blessing that we have being the children of God. The Lord bless you and keep you. Tonight, if you have a need, if we can encourage, if we can pray for you, I'm reminded over and over that as the family of God, we have opportunity. And we should take that opportunity to pray for one another. We should be praying for one another even if we don't know what's going on in the lives of those around us. Brother Flavio made a, a statement and I have to, I have to tell on him for this. Uh, and maybe embarrass him just a little bit. He says each time that the Lord's invitation is extended, he wants to come forward, not necessarily for doing anything wrong, but to let people know how good God truly is to us. How wonderful of a statement that is. And I hope it doesn't embarrass him for me saying that. He's, he's shaking his head no. But truly it is when you think about it. What a beautiful thought. A God who loves us that much to send His only begotten Son to die. We can respond to that love by our obedience to the gospel. And if we can help you with that, won't you come to the front while we stand and while we sing.